DNA or deoxyribonucleic acid is a polymer of nucleotides. It is a polynucleotide chain. So you can find many nucleotides attached to one another to form a chain. So it is called as a polymer of nucleotides. <coughs> In DNA, we have two important bonds or linkages. One is the glycosidic bond and the second one is the phosphodiester bond. What is a glycosidic bond? Glycosidic bonds are linkages between the nitrogenous base and the pentose sugar. So here you can find that this is the pentose sugar, isn't it? This is the pentose sugar. It is linked to a nitrogenous base. So here this linking between the nitrogenous base and the carbon 1 atom of the pentose sugar is called as a glycosidic bond or a glycosidic linkage. Both glycosidic bonds and glycosidic linkages are formed due to condensation reaction which is involved with elimination of water. Okay, So in DNA we have two kinds of bonds that is glycosidic bond and phosphodiester bond. What is a glycosidic bond? Glycosidic bond is a linkage or a bond between the pentose sugar and the nitrogenous base. So the glycosidic bond that is the link or the bond between the pentose sugar and the nitrogenous base gives rise to a nucleoside, isn't it? Pentose sugar and nitrogenous base give rise to nucleoside. So when the nitrogenous base is a adenine, okay, when the nitrogenous base is adenine. So here you can see we have the deoxyribose sugar molecule which is attached with adenine nitrogenous base. So then what is the nucleoside which we get? The nucleoside is deoxyadenosine. Okay, so what is deoxyadenosine? Deoxyribose sugar plus adenine which is linked together by glycosidic linkage. Did you understand? So now you must not get confused. So under nucleosides we have four types that is deoxyadenosine, deoxyguanosine, deoxycytidine and deoxythymidine. So what is deoxyadenosine? Ribose sugar, ribose sugar linked with adenine nitrogen base by the glycosidic bond that gives deoxyadenosine. Similarly the deoxyribose sugar linked with guanine, the nitrogenous base guanine linked with the pentose sugar deoxyribose gives rise to another nucleoside called as deoxyguanosine. So the ribose sugar is the same in all of them. The only difference is in the nitrogenous base. So one ribose sugar is linked with one nitrogenous base. When the nitrogenous base is adenine, it gives rise to deoxyadenosine. When the nitrogenous base is guanine, it gives rise to deoxyguanosine. And then when the nitrogenous base is cytosine, it gives rise to deoxycytidine. And when the nitrogenous base is thymine, it gives rise to deoxythymidine. And all of these four are nucleosides. Got it? We have four kinds of nucleosides in DNA that is deoxyadenosine, deoxyguanosine, deoxycytidine and deoxythymidine. So what happens in the case of RNA? Okay, in RNA it is adenosine where in RNA what happens is instead of deoxyribose sugar here we have a ribose sugar which gives rise to adenosine, guanosine, cytidine and in the place of thymine we have uridine. Can you recall? In RNA we do not have thymine, we have uridine, isn't it? So what are the nucleosides in DNA? Just let's list it out. So 
so the nucleosides in dna are deoxyadenosine deoxyguanosine deoxycytidine and deoxythymidine what are the nucleosides in rna in rna we have adenosine we have guanosine we have cytidine and the last one instead of thymine we have uracil isn't it so there we have uridine so now you might get a question what are the nucleosides present in dna or what are the nucleosides present in rna so suppose uh, you get these options and in the fourth one instead of uridine if it is something else so now you must be able to have a clear picture as to what are the nucleosides in dna and what are the nucleosides in rna so that you can arrive at the right answer so did you understand about the glycosidic linkage glycosidic linkage is a linkage between the pentose sugar and the nitrogenous base the second bond or the linkage that is present in dna is the phosphodiester bond what is the phosphodiester bond phosphodiester bond is the one which connects adjacent nucleotides okay so when we have adjacent nucleotides a t c g a t t so it is a phosphodiester bonds which connect them together to form a polymer of nucleotides or it is the phosphodiester bond which forms the nucleotide chain see you can see here this is the pentose sugar this is the phosphodiester bond so this is one ester bond and this is the other ester bond and this complete bond is called as the phosphodiester bond so here we have one pentose sugar connected to one nitrogen base so this is one nucleotide okay and this is the second nucleotide so the nucleotides one nucleotide is connected to the next nucleotide through phosphorus by a phosphodiester bond so why do we call it as a phosphodiester bond because each phosphate or hydroxyl bond is an ester bond and the linkage between the two is called 3 prime phosphodiester linkage or bond so here you can see this is one ester bond right this is one ester bond and this is another ester bond and here we have phosphorus molecule isn't it so since each phosphate hydroxyl bond is an ester bond the linkage between these two is called as 3 prime to 5 prime phosphodiester linkage or bond so now did you understand what is a glycosidic bond and what is a phosphodiester bond glycosidic bond is the bond between a pentose sugar and a nitrogenous base whereas phosphodiester bond is the bond which connects two adjacent nucleotides and both of them are formed by the condensation reaction which involves elimination of water so these are the two important bonds in the dna structure so here i can show you see this is the phosphodiester bond isn't it this is one nucleotide okay this is the nucleotide adenine isn't it this is adenine nucleotide and this is thymine nucleotide okay and they both are connected by this phosphodiester bond so as i already told you phosphodiester bond is the one which connects adjacent nucleotides with a phosphate group this is the phosphodiester bond and what about the glycosidic bond here you can see this is the pentose sugar and the pentose sugar is connected to the nitrogenous base adenine over here so this is the glycosidic bond this is the glycosidic bond and this is the 
phosphodiester bond. And in addition to this, we also have hydrogen bonds. That is hydrogen bonds between adenine and thymine and guanine and cytosine. Okay. That is the nucleotides are bonding with the opposite base pairs. So, this is called as one base pair which we shall be discussing shortly. Okay. So, this is the base pair. So, you know DNA always adenine base pairs with thymine with two hydrogen bonds. You can see the two hydrogen bonds here and then guanine always base pairs with cytosine with three hydrogen bonds. Got it? So we shall be discussing this further. Do not worry. So, the three bonds are glycosidic bond, phosphodiester bond and the hydrogen bonds. This is how a double stranded DNA molecule looks like. Okay, this is the double stranded polynucleotide chain. Here you can find one strand of DNA moving in 5 prime to 3 prime direction and the other strand of DNA in 3 prime to 5 prime direction. So now we all must be wondering what is the length of the DNA? How long is it? So how do we measure the length of the DNA? So DNA is a long polymer of deoxyribonucleotides, isn't it? Its length is defined as the number of nucleotides or a pair of nucleotide referred to as base pair. So how do we measure the length of DNA? We measure it in the form of base pairs. So here you can see this is one base pair. AT is one base pair. And then this one is the second base pair, another AT. So this is one base pair. This is another base pair. So like this, we can count 1, 2, 3, 4. That count gives us the length of DNA. Got it? How do we measure DNA? How do we know what is the length of DNA? So we measure the nucleotides or a pair of nucleotides. So this is one pair of nucleotides that is AT. This is another pair of nucleotide GC. So here in this DNA, you can find there are four nucleotide pairs, isn't it? This is one, this is two, this is three and this is four. So there are four base pairs, four nucleotide base pairs. So the length of this DNA is four. So like this, we can find that the length of DNA varies from organism to organism. Say for example, in E. coli or Escherichia coli, the length of the DNA is 4.6. In E. coli or Escherichia coli, the length of the DNA is 4.6 into 10 to the power of 6 base pairs and base pairs is represented by small letters B and P. Okay, so like this the length of the DNA varies from species and organism to organism. What is Escherichia coli? It is a simple bacteria which is present in our own colon. Isn't it? It is present in all of us. Fine. So the length of the DNA or the length of the DNA in E. coli bacteria is 4.6 into 10 to the power of 6 base pairs. And what do I mean by polarity of DNA? Polarity means you can see that we have two strands of DNA which are coiled or twisted with each other. And in that you can find that one strand of DNA runs in the 5 prime to 3 prime direction and the other one runs in the 3 prime to 5 prime direction. So in the 5 prime end you can find that we have a free phosphate group. See here, see this strand, okay this strand of DNA is in 5 prime to 3 prime direction and this strand of DNA is in 3 prime to 5 prime direction. So when we say polarity, 5 prime end means it has a free phosphate group at the 
this position and at the 3 prime position you have a free hydroxyl group this is what we mean by polarity in the dna so 5 prime end means there is a free phosphate group and 3 prime end means there is a free hydroxyl group got it Now finally coming to the structure of DNA. In 1950 to 1953, several researchers did research and they gave us significant knowledge about the DNA. So many researchers, scientists like Edwin Chagov, Morris Wilkins, Rosalind Franklin, James Watson and Francis Crick based on their studies gave us a lot of knowledge about the structure of DNA. However, in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick proposed the double helical structure of DNA. In 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick gave us the double helical structure of DNA based on two major investigations. First one was the charge of rules and second one is the x-ray diffraction pattern of DNA. What are charge of rules? The charge of rules has three important rules. First one is the purines and pyrimidines are always in equal amounts. The purines and pyrimidines. What are the purines? Adenine and guanine, isn't it? And what are the pyrimidines? Cytosine and thymine. So, the amount of adenine and guanine will always be equal to the amount of cytosine and thymine. This is the first rule of Chargaff rule. That is, adenine, the amount of adenine and guanine will always be equal to that of the amount of cytosine plus thymine. Okay, this is the first rule. Now, moving on to the second rule. The amount of adenine is always equal to that of thymine and the amount of guanine is always equal to that of cytosine. That is, the amount of adenine is always equal to that of thymine and the amount of guanine is always equal to that of cytosine. So, this gives us the second charge of rule that is adenine and thymine amounts are always equal and guanine and cytosine amounts are always equal. Now moving on to the third rule of Chargaff's rule. It states that the base ratio of adenine and thymine that is A plus T is always constant for a species. The base ratio of adenine and thymine is constant for a species. However, it may vary from one species to another. Say for example, we all belong to homo sapiens, isn't it? So, the base ratio of A plus T will be same in all, hom all homo sapiens. However, the A plus T will be different in a monkey or it, might be, it will be different in a dog or cat which belong to another species. However, among the members, all the members belonging to a particular species, the base ratio of A plus T will be constant. And this helps us to identify which species that particular animal belongs to. Got it? So, that, uh, the third Chargaff rule says that the adenine plus thymine, adenine plus thymine base ratio will be constant for a species. Okay? So, if you are among all the members belong to a particular species, the adenine plus thymine ratio will be constant. Did you understand the three Chargaff rules? So, it is based on the Chargaff rules and the X-ray studies that James Watson and Francis Crick were finally able to propose the double helical structure. That is why Chargaff's rule is very important. So, you might get this also as a question. So, what are the three rules of Chargaff's rules? And you might, they might give you these equations. So, then there might be some wrong equation also. Say, for example, there in the last, apart from all these three options, you might get one more option saying um, the base ratio of guanine and cytosine is always constant for a species. 
Now say the question is which of the following is not a Chargaff rule? Okay, so the first option will be a plus t equal a plus g equal to t plus c. So this can be the first option. This can be the second option. And a plus t is constant for a species. This can be the third option. And the fourth option can be g plus c is constant for a species. So now if the question is which is not a Chargaff rule, which is not a point in the Chargaff rule, then this will be the right answer. Isn't it? Because all the above three are points in the Chagaf rule. All the three are important uh, rules of the Chagaf rules. Got it? So this is how you have to find out questions and answer it so that you do not get confused in the examination. In addition to the Chagaf rule, the X-ray diffraction pattern of DNA given by Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin in 1953 also was helpful for Watson and Crick to propose their double helical structure. So in 1953, Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin did X-ray diffraction studies and they, and they got the pictures of crystalline DNA. Based on the pictures which they got about the DNA, they concluded that DNA is a long molecule consisting of two similar DNA strands running in parallel and helical manner where successive nucleotides occur at intervals of 0.34 nanometer. So now you might even get a question, is it that only Watson and Crick said that the double helical structure, is it only them who observed the double helical structure or whether anybody else prior to them who said that DNA has two polynucleotide chains which are running in anti-parallel direction. So then it is not just Watson and Craig, even Morris and Wilkins, Morris Wilkins and Rosalind Franklin based on the pictures of the crystalline DNA. So this is the picture which they saw. Okay, so based on the pictures of the crystalline DNA, they also concluded that DNA is made up of two strands which are parallel to each other. So that also can be an option, isn't it? So they said that based on the pictures of the crystalline DNA, they concluded that DNA is a long molecule consisting of two similar DNA strands running in parallel direction and they have nucleotides occurring at successive uh, gaps and those intervals are of the measurement 0.34 nanometer or we can also call it as 34 angstrom unit. Isn't it? 0.34 nanometer is also 34 angstrom unit. So based on the X-ray diffraction pattern of DNA, and also based on the investi these two important investigations, that is the X-ray diffraction pattern of DNA and the Chagoff rules, finally in 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick proposed the double helical structure of DNA. So what are the salient features of the double helical structure of DNA? First and foremost, DNA is made up of two polynucleotide chains or strands. So these are the important features of the double helical structure of DNA proposed by James Watson and Francis Crick in 1953. So first one is the DNA is composed of two polynucleotide chains or strands. The DNA is composed of two polynucleotide chains or strands. So here you can see DNA is made up of two chains or strands, isn't it? One strand runs from 5 prime to 3 prime direction and the other one runs from 3 prime to 5 prime direction. Then there are glycosidic and phosphodiester linkages. There are 
glycosidic and phosphodiester linkages so uh, already we have discussed what is a glycosidic bond what is a phosphodiester bond and where they occur in the dna then the dna is a duplex dna is a duplex so if you need to pictureize how exactly the dna will look like just take two threads tie a knot at one end and hold the fix that to a surface or somewhere and then hold the other two strands and rotate it in a right handed fashion like this so the resultant whatever you get that is exactly how a dna looks like okay dna is rotated in a right handed fashion so in a dna duplex you can find that the one twist or one turn is equal to 34 angstroms or 3.4 nanometer is it it so this is one turn of the dna from here up to here this is one turn of the dna and in that one turn you can find approximately 10 base pairs so in every turn of the dna there are approximately 10 base pairs and this one turn measures 34 angstrom unit or 3.4 nanometer okay and then we have two kinds of grooves in dna this is the major groove and this is the minor groove can you see this here again you can see this is the major groove this region over here this is the major groove and this region over here this is the minor groove and then the diameter of dna if you see the thickness of the dna the diameter that is the distance from here to here that is 20 angstrom units or 2 nanometer okay so this this region is called as the diameter these are very important you definitely need to remember this so the diameter of dna is 2 nanometer or 20 angstrom units and then this is the major group this is the minor group just based on the structure okay these numbers itself you can get different kinds of questions so keep this in mind so that you remember this the diameter of dna is 2 nanometer or 2 angstrom or uh, is uh, 2 nanometer or 20 angstrom unit and then in per turn okay per turn of the helix you have approximately 10 base pairs which measures and this measurement is 34 angstrom unit or 3 nanometer okay and then the diameter is 20 angstrom unit or 2 nanometer so there are two strands which are running in opposite direction okay one is in 5 prime to 3 prime direction and the other one is 3 prime to 5 prime direction and the coiling is plectonemic coiling is plectonemic what do we mean by plectonemic that is the two strands cannot be separated without completely unwinding them the dna is plectonomic remember this word please do not get confused with this word when you get it in the option what do we mean by plectonomic plectonomic means the two strands of dna cannot be completely separated without unwinding so here you can see there are two strands until and unless you unwind them completely you cannot separate the two strands isn't it that is what we mean by plectonomic okay so dna is plectonomic and then the backbone of dna what is the backbone of dna the ribosugar okay the ribosugar and the phosphate group forms the backbone of dna and from that backbone you can find the nitrogenous bases projecting inwards i will show you here see here you will have the ribosugar and the phosphate group okay so here completely uh, here you can find the ribosugar and the phosphate groups whereas here you can find the nitrogenous bases projecting inside so it is the ribosugar and the phosphate group which acts as the backbone of dna and from this backbone you can find the nitrogenous bases projecting inwards 
so in this picture this this is t this is thymine this is adenine and this is guanine and this is cytosine so orange is guanine yellow is cytosine green is thymine and blue is adenine so here this is the backbone of dna so in this backbone you will have nitrogen you will have pento sugar and phosphate group and then from this backbone you can find the nitrogenous bases projecting inwards got it did you understand backbone of dna what is the backbone of dna and how the nitrogenous bases project inwards then polarity i already told you about the polarity of dna isn't it so here in dna we have two strands one strand running from 5 prime to 3 prime direction and the other one in the opposite that is 3 prime to 5 prime direction at the 5 prime end we have a free phosphate group and at the 3 prime end we have a free hydroxyl group this is what we mean by polarity of the dna and then here in the double helical structure of dna watson and crick also spoke about the complementary base pairing so you can find that in dna though we have purines and pyrimidines isn't it adenine and guanine are purines cytosine and thymine are pyrimidines you can find that one purine combines with another pyrimidine so adenine always base pairs with thymine with two hydrogen bonds and then guanine always bears pairs with cytosine with three hydrogen bond and this is what we call it as complementary base pairing did you understand what we mean by complementary base pairing adenine always base pairs with thymine you can see this in the picture over here so this is adenine sorry this is adenine it is base pairing with thymine this is adenine it is base pairing with thymine and then here you can see guanine is base pairing with cytosine here again guanine is base pairing with cytosine so adenine always bears pair with thymine with true hydrogen bonds and guanine always bears pairs with cytosine through three hydrogen bonds this is what we call it as complementary base pairing and then anti parallel strands so what do you mean by anti parallel that is we have two strands that in the one in 5 prime to 3 prime direction and the other one is parallel to that but it runs in the opposite direction that is 3 prime to 5 prime direction so now shall we summarize the double helical structure of dna once once again so according to the double helical structure proposed by james watson and francis crick in 1953 dna is composed of two polynucleotide chains the two chains have anti parallel polarity that is one chain runs from 5 prime to 3 prime direction and the other chain runs from 3 prime to 5 prime direction and the backbone of each polynucleotide chain is composed of ribo sugar and the phosphate group and from the backbone you can find the nitrogenous bases projecting projecting here and then a purine always base pairs with the pyrimidine specifically adenine always bears pairs with a pyrimidine called as thymine and guanine which is a purine always bears pairs with the pyrimidine called as cytosine this is what we call it as complementary base pairing the double helical chain the double chain is coiled in a helical fashion okay so this kind of coiling is called as helical fashion and it is also a right handed fashion okay the coiling is right handed and because of this right handed helical coiling you can find the presence of major grooves and minor grooves and then the pitch of the helix okay this is the pitch of the helix the pitch means the turn 
a, a single turn is called as the pitch. The pitch of the helix is around 3.4 nanometer which consists of 10 base pairs or it is also 34 angstrom units. And then the planes of adjacent base pairs are stacked over one another. Okay, so I think now you understood about the double helical structure of DNA. So hope you had a proper good understanding about the DNA structure, the composition of DNA, the occurrence of DNA in prokaryotic and eukaryotic cell. What are the different bonds or the linkages that are present in DNA and what are the salient features of the double helical structure of DNA which was proposed by Watson and Crick based on the investigations which were also supportive for them that is the Chagoff rules and the X-ray studies. We shall further continue the series of lectures for NEET examination. If you have any doubts or if you want to connect with me you can definitely comment on the comment section until then take care bye i will soon meet you in another video thank you